In the past couple of weeks, I've been getting lots and lots of questions about e-spinners, and so I wanted to talk more about these two e-spinners today. Hey there, thank you so much for being here. My name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia and this is Taking Back Friday. This is a place where we come every Friday and we talk about knitting and spinning and weaving and dyeing. Today, I wanna to talk more about spinning with an e-spinner. It's come up more frequently in the past couple of weeks because a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Debbie Held, who is a spinner and an, a writer, come and teach a workshop for us for the School of Sweet Georgia called Spinning with E-Spinners. And, uh, there's so much to know about these things and there's so many options. And so what I wanted to do was share a little bit about these two e-spinners with you because our original plan was to have Debbie come into Vancouver and we were gonna film her with her e-spinners together with my e-spinners. But because we couldn't physically get together, she is in Atlanta and Georgia and we're here in Vancouver in Canada. We, <laughs> she, she presented with half of the e-spinners and I have another set here. So in that workshop that we have on the school, she demonstrated a lot of the techniques with a Hansen mini spinner, uh, which I have owned in the past. Uh, she has demonstrated some of the techniques with a Daedalus magpie, which I'd never seen before. Um, and so that was very, very interesting to see. And she also had her uh, Nano as well, her Nano Electric Eel 1.1. Hers is green, mine is purple. <laughs> but yeah, we both have these little nano electric e-spinners. And I had the Ashford, this is the Ashford e-spinner 3. And so we were going to put all of these sort of side by side and demonstrate and show them. And so, you know, you can see the relative size difference between all of the e-spinners. You know, this one obviously is very, very tiny fits in the palm of your hand. She also demonstrated that her Hansen mini spinner basically fits in her hand as well. It's also quite, you know, compact about this, about this size. That's from what I remember, it's about this size. And then this is the Ashford, which could theoretically fit in one hand, but you know, it's a little bit heavy. I think they're all about, they're all about the same weight and stuff like that. And part of the conversation in the workshop was that we have so many options that are available to us now for e-spinners. And when I first started spinning back in like 2004, 2005, there, it, like having an e-spinner was like, a, it was like a dream. It was like a fantasy to be able to own something that would, would would be electric powered. It was just, it was crazy to think. And I know that my spinning teacher had a Roberta and we got to see that and it was like, wow, amazing. Uh, but now we have all of these options available to us. And um, we have options that are as low as $100 US all the way to options that are almost $2,000 US. And so there's kind of something for everyone. And uh, we were not able to get our hands on every single model that was available out there for e-spinners, although that would have been really cool. And so we wanted to at least put together sort of like a chart, a comparison of all of the different e-spinner options that are available on the market so that it could help maybe you find, you know, your sweet spot. What would work for you? What would be the most ideal e-spinner for you if this is something that you're considering? So I tend to talk a lot about accessibility in terms of being able to get your hands on and to be able to use some of the spinning and weaving equipment because it is very powerful. These tools are very powerful, but they do cost some money. And so it's really important to be able to have access to options at all different budgets, all different levels. So. It's amazing to me that, you know, you can get a beautiful, beautiful supported spindle for something like, you know, $80, $70, $75, something like that. And then to also have access to something like an electric wheel that's only $100. This is an option for many, many people and it can help you get into spinning if this is the very first thing that you want to try. And then here, the Ashford E-Spinner 3, this one is probably around like the eight or $900 range. As Debbie mentioned in her workshop, this is more like the higher end of, the higher end of the mid-range sort of, uh, of E-Spinners, but I feel like I've been using this uh, on an almost daily basis for the past several weeks at least and it is just a workhorse. It just goes. And I love that, you know, it's portable for me. I put it on my Ikea cart, I wheel it around, and uh, it's been really, really great for my 
for my lifestyle. It might not be for everyone. You might think that this is too big for you or something like that, but this has been good for me and my needs and what I'm using right now. During the workshop in the chat, there was lots of other e-spinners coming up. You know, lots of people saying that they either own the Daedalus or that they own a Spinolution Firefly. And so all of these options are out there now. And it's really, really great to see. We're very lucky to have all these options. So one of the questions that I got about spinning with an e-spinner was spinning long draw on them and having them set up in a way that would really work well for spinning long draw. So one of the people who wrote me has both a Nano and an Ashford, exactly the same combination that I had, and um, she was wondering about spinning long draw. Now the way that I spin long draw, I, I do kind of a supported long draw, I guess, and so you can see uh, what I'm doing here spin a little bit. This fiber that I'm using here, this is Targi, 100% Targi, and uh, I'm just going to fluff it up a little bit so that we have something to work with. So I find that in order to get enough twist in for the long draw action, what I need to do is I actually crank up my speed so that I'm putting in much more twist for the same amount of time. So the twist goes into the yarn faster and then I'm able to pull back. I also um, sort of pinch a little bit, pinch and let go and pinch and let go at this front because I need something to tug against. I don't tug against the e-spinner itself. So that's kind of what I'm doing in order to make that long draw happen. You can actually do the same thing. I found you can do the same thing with the Nano as well. So I'm just gonna turn it on. I'm gonna move my little guide here. And turn up the speed. Now I also got questions about rewinding bobbins and rewinding this yarn that I've spun onto different bobbins. And so I'll demonstrate what I do with that. But basically once I've spun all this yarn onto the bobbin, I've actually spun multiple chunks of fiber from different colors and things like that onto this bobbin because this is such a big bobbin. This is a jumbo bobbin. And so it fits a lot of yarn. So what I'm gonna do is I actually have my uh, bobbin winder, my electric bobbin winder, and I'm gonna take these uh, weaving bobbins and I'm just going to roll them off onto this and then I'm going to ply from these bobbins and by doing that I basically reverse the direction of the yarn as it's coming off of the bobbin for plying. So I kind of want to return the spinning back to the way it was before when I was spinning the yarn in the first place. 
So Rachel talks about this, Rachel Smith from Welford Pearls. You can find her YouTube channel as well. She talks about spinning, 100% spinning, uh, mostly spinning. <laughs> but uh, she also teaches uh, one of the classes on the School of Sweet Georgia, uh, talking about spinning to make a sweater, spinning to knit socks. And she talks about this technique of rewinding your yarn off of this bobbin that you've spun onto storage bobbins and then plying from storage bobbins. And the whole reason for this is to create a much more even, much more um, smooth yarn because you are conditioning the yarn, you're allowing that yarn and the twist that's in this spun yarn to equalize itself over a longer distance. So you can set up this bobbin far away from your bobbin winder so that it gives it some space for the twist to even out. Because if you're spinning super close to your wheel or your e-spinner, then all of the twist is building up here, but it might be inconsistent from, you know, six inches and this next six inches might have a lot of twist and the next six inches might not have a lot of twist in it. So by spreading that distance out, you get to equalize the twist throughout and make a much more even, smooth and consistent plied yarn. That's the goal. So I'll do that next. There we go. So those, these two are together and these two will get plied together. And now we need some more bottoms. That's not gonna fit. Now, if at all possible, you can try and get these two devices far away from each other if possible. And you can see I have my brake band on still on the back of this wheel, on the back of this bobbin. I still put the brake band on and that is to keep it almost like a tensioned cate so that it's not back spinning or spinning in the opposite direction as I try to do this winding. So there's my big knot, and that tells me that I need to switch off to a new bobbin. There we have it, empty bobbin, ready to spin again. So that is basically it for today. If you have any questions about e-spinners, if you have anything that you, you would just love to know about e-spinners and how they're different from wheels, or if you should get one, all of these questions, please feel free to leave your comments below. Feel free to join us on the School of Sweet Georgia to watch Debbie's workshop about that. And uh, yeah, if you like this episode, please hit like. And if you'd like to see more content like this, please do hit subscribe and come here every Friday and we talk about knitting and spinning and weaving and fiber arts and all these wonderful things. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you in the next one. All right, bye for now.